Welcome to episode 127 of Diffuse Congruence. We are back. Salam alaikum, Parvez. Alaikum salam, Umar. Good to be back. Good to be back. And we are at wonderful Zaytuna College in the Berkeley Hills. Yeah. Which is uh, Holy exciting. Hill. A top Holy <laughs> Hill, right? Yeah. That's right. And both of the, you know, we, of course, uh, for both of us, Zaytuna holds a special place in our heart. Very much it's so. It's been very um, instrumental in our in, in our uh, faith uh, through the years in, in yeah. different ways. Yeah. So super excited to be here. And of course, joined by a guest, this time by Ahmad Khan of Creative minority podcast a fellow podcaster we thought it'd be fun to get together with a fellow podcaster uh, who also uh, has topics related to islam in america and we thought we'd get together and hear a little about uh, his podcast and 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 share about our mutual podcast and learn from each other and and uh engage in discussion about all things podcasting so welcome ahmed thank you omar thank you Pervez, for having me on it's a pleasure, Omar. Um, I mean, well, it's a pleasure to be back, Omar, and it's a pleasure, Ahmed, uh, for you to be able to take the time in joining us. Um, yeah, so you, um, it's been amazing. Like, you actually came on my radar through a mutual friend, Moise, who, I, again, a shout out to Moise. I always give a shout out to Moise because he's instrumental in connecting me with people that um, he thinks would be great guests for the show. So uh, shout out to Moise again. Uh, for introducing us and then we kind of like I think we we exchanged a couple of messages and then nothing sort of came of it but then we met in person um, and I think we kind of met even accidentally at a at a fundraiser we, you know where, where Sheikh Hamza was the keynote um, and then yeah the, 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 this sort of happened as a way of that so I'm, I'm really grateful that we did get a chance to connect and uh, um, I'll be honest when when Moise first told me about you and the podcast, um, you know, I was sort of like, what? There's a podcast that comes out of the Bay Area that's not, you know, Imran Malik that used to do it, you know, Imran Malik and, and, and Submitter. Um, but yeah, so, no, he's like, no, it's Creative Minority. You should check it out. And I did. And I, so I, I've, I've done, I wouldn't say a deep dive, but I've certainly checked out a few episodes. So, um, yeah, like Omar said, I think this would be a great opportunity for us to kind of exchange what brought us to podcasting the goods the bads you know the uglies maybe um and and what we kind of see in this space and maybe any other contemporary issues that we want to talk about but as we like to do at least since you're a guest on our show um as we like to do we like to ask for your origin story so where do you hail from um you're presently here in berkeley and but, would it yeah, be okay for yeah. just for the for our for our, for our listeners who may not have heard about the podcast. I think it'd be it'd be useful to level set and just really oh, quickly yeah. talk about what the podcast is that's about. Good, we'll good. get back into um, more about the podcast as we as we talk. But just to just just so people have a feel for um, yeah. for the topic. Yeah, thank you for having me. And it's the podcast world is definitely a very interesting world, as you guys know. Mm -hmm. And um, when you first enter the podcast world, you kind of have certain ideas of how you think you want to run a podcast. But as time kind of progresses, you kind of figure out your niche and the topics you really want to focus on. Yeah. And so um, for me, I've been, I think it's almost about two years now since I've been doing this podcast. Um, you know, one of the blessings of COVID is that the podcast industry really blew up mm -hmm. um, because now people realize you didn't necessarily have to do it in person mm -hmm. and that you could just do it online. And so it was during that moment, you know, I had been debating for a while whether or not I wanted to start it. And I had these ideas of wanting to interview um, reputable scholars in their fields, whether it be in academia, scholarship, uh, journalism, and so forth. And so finally, you know, um, I made the decision. And, uh, you know, it's funny because in the interest, uh, I don't know if either of you know this, but when I first, th the biggest hurdle I had with starting a podcast was trying to come up with the right name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, same. And so I spent almost months waiting tr trying to identify what the right name would be and so ultimately i decided that you know if i didn't have a name by a specific date i was just going to call it the ahmed khan podcast okay like the joe rogan podcast right. uh there's like that funny story of how when apple was created mm -hmm. they all sat in a room and they said you know we're going to give we're going to dedicate some time to identify a name and if we can't we'll just name it apple mm. and that and that's how it became apple so I decided, uh, I, I named it initially the Ahmed Khan podcast. Um, and I initially was just, it's very interesting because the first podcast I did was on the importance of storytelling. Mm. 
because yeah. I felt early on that, you know, our stories are what need to be told. The stories of our great ancestors. And there's a, there's a very famous saying from Plato in the Republic where he says that, show me the stories that you tell your children and I'll show you your culture. I'll show you your society. That's right. And so for me growing up, uh, there were always stories that my parents had taught me, especially from the partition, mm. right? You know, my grandfather, my grandmother, they're directly involved, they left. And so those stories were very powerful for me growing up. Um, and so initially, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to tell stories. Um, and then later on, I actually named it, renamed it to the creative minority. And uh, some people think I'm playing the minority card, but it's actually a term by uh, British historian Arnold Toynbee, who said that when society, when civilizations are reaching a, a, a point of crisis, they need these people that are called the creative minority who are able to creatively engage these topics. And not just a stagnant manner that's, you know, because things have always been done this way, we're going to do it. But creatively, they're thinking about solutions to these problems. And, you know, Shaykh Hamza Yusuf mentions that in the Quran, in Surah Hud, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the ulu baqiyah, mm -hmm. that the qualities of, the, of this group of people is very identical to the creative minority, the concept of the creative minority. Um, the idea that Allah says that, you know, if the, you have these... Uh, uh, and it's described as qalil, like a few, which is where the, I get the name minority from. That if, the, if these few people are in a society and they're encouraging people towards good um, and they're condemning wrong, uh, some scholars said then the punishment of God wouldn't, have, wouldn't ha come and the civilization wouldn't collapse. So it's just trying to do my own due diligence of trying to, I was always very um, intellectually stimulated. I loved reading books. And so um, I decided that going moving a little bit away from storytelling and realizing that my, my my pursuit was really an intellectual pursuit on the big questions of reality and so forth. And so that's what my podcast aims to do um, is, um, you know, almost every everybody I interview actually has a PhD. Uh, and I make sure they're a reputable scholar and so forth. And we have these very um, engaging conversations. So if you have us on the podcast, we'll be your exception because neither of us have PhDs. So. Oh, you guys have a PhD in life. <laughs> <laughs> so you, it's, it's, uh, we, we sh um, maybe you can give us just a, f a taste of some of the guests you've had yeah. on and, and the topics you've discussed. Because I'd love for people who listen to our podcast to check out yours. So, you know, we're, 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 there's no territoriality here. So I, I definitely want you to take this as an opportunity to feel free to plug your own show um, and tell us about it. And yeah, and get our listeners excited about it. So um, given that we are at Zaytuna, there are several Zaytuna faculty members who have had um, Dr. Ali al Thai first most, an absolute giant in comparative religion, um, a master of, you know, I think six, seven languages and so forth. Right. Um, and then we've had um, we've had some psychologists like our counselor, as they tune in, Dr. Hiba Al-Haddad, on just the crisis of mental health that we're in and the reasons why we have this crisis. And one of the things I always like to do on my podcast is I always like to hear what the Islamic perspective on a lot of these topics are. So, is, so for, for something like mental health, you really want somebody who's trained in both disciplines, who knows both of them very well to really give an examination. And her PhD, I believe, is looking at the analysis of postmodernism on the mental health industry. Um, so that was one of my uh, favorite podcasts. We've had a lot of influential Muslims in the public circles on the podcast, people like um, Dr. Mohammed Ghilan, people like um, Maheen, uh, Paul from Blogging Theology, um, and other academics and so forth. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's definitely been a very uh, intellectually stimulating podcast. And I think one thing you guys can probably concur with is that um, the person who benefits most from the podcast is usually the person who's doing the interview. That's yeah, right. Absolutely. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. Um, well, we, I think you gave the, you, the listeners uh, uh, some, <laughs> some uh, ideas to go back and, and check out your catalog. So Yeah, for yeah, sure. I'll be and, doing the same. Um, I mean, in the spirit of, I think, like sharing kind of origin stories of, of, of podcasts and, and names and so on. Um, yeah, that was a similar kind of challenge. Um, and, and I, you know, I know our listeners know this, but y you may not know this. And by extension, your listeners who you will introduce us to, inshallah, don't know this. Uh, but yeah, Diffuse Congruence, the, the, the name, again, plays on many levels, just like Creative Minority. It actually is an expression used 
not by um, Toynbee, but by Sherman Jackson. And Dr. Jackson translates the Islamic tradition or um, in our tradition, the concept of motawatur or tawatur as diffused congruence. And the play on words for us was we, like you, we were interested in telling people stories. We were interested in, 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 in talking to people, um, you know, w with extensive backgrounds in particular disciplines. Um, but more importantly, we were interested in talking with these people to certainly, to certainly learn from them, but also as a way to capture an oral history. Because I think that, hmm. um, I remember to me, one of the moments that I realized that a lot of the giants that we, that our community stands on the shoulders of, uh, you know, are here today, but gone tomorrow, potentially, was when Dr. Ahmed Sucker died. Dr. Ahmed Sucker, you know, for those who may not know, pioneer in our community, huge impact on the Muslim community, uh, certainly from the 60s on, um, you know, and when he passed, I said, you know, where's his story? Like, did someone capture, you know, his biography, as it were? So we started off, you know, kind of the impetus to start the show was to, was to again, highlight and showcase those individual stories. Um, and, you know, again, for listeners, they know this. I mean, you know, whether it was Dr. Omer, whether it's Dr. Sherman Jackson, um, you know, uh, many of the faculty members you've mentioned, uh, uh, Dr. Ali Atai has been on the show. So, you know, we, we've shared their stories in addition to engaging them in a discussion or a conversation around topics of research or topics of specialty. So, um, so I think we share that in common, the idea of wanting to, you know, tell people stories. Um, but yeah, I, I, I concur with you also in the sense that we've benefited the most. And I certainly had a mm -hmm. very, very, and I, I make no qualms about this, qualms about this. I had a very selfish motivation for starting the podcast because I wanted to be able to sit across the table from people like Dr. Jackson and I wanted to capture their story. You know, I've learned from them, I've benefited from them, but now I want to capture their story. You know, I want to, so, so that's really, that was kind of our impetus and, uh, you know, we did start many, many moons ago. So we've been in the podcasting space in 2013. And, and as a, as a, as a, as a would-be historian yourself, Ahmed, I think you'll appreciate when we started the podcast in 2013, at that time, to my knowledge, there was only one other Muslim podcast. And let me define terms here. Mus by Muslim podcast, I mean, you know, Muslims telling, you know, talking about Muslim issues or Muslims talking about Muslim stories. So at that time, there was a podcast um, called, I think it was called Good Muslim, Bad mm -hmm. Muslim. Yeah. It was hosted by two, two sisters. That was the only Muslim podcast in the space. Um, and so when we started, you know, Zaki and I, Zaki had already been doing a podcast of his own in his area of focus yeah. specialty, which is pop culture, media, uh, movies, and film. And so he kind of knew the space, but didn't know the kind of particular Muslim channel, if you will. Um, and so we got plugged in and now mashallah, like obviously it's been a, it's, it's grown and it's a burgeoning space. And I think like you mentioned, a lot of it came out also during the pandemic yeah. where people realize this is a great way to connect and also connect with people uh, in terms of an audience. So, you know, you know, yeah, Barbez, yeah. I'm actually hitting my three year anniversary. So that tells you, and I joined like well yeah. into the show being around, like yeah. I think it had been around for seven years. Uh, when I joined, yeah, um, Zucky then got tied up with other projects, and now it's been three years since, I've, right. since I've been around. You joined right before the pandemic, yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Um, and you know, inshallah, you'll one day celebrate a point where you've been around. You've been a co-host longer than Zucky has, so, <laughs> or Zucky was, <laughs> right, um, right. But anyway, sorry, Ahmed, coming back to you. So, um, no, no, I thank you for that, and uh, um, I guess you know. I, I do want to, I, I want to talk about your story and then I, but I think I, I do definitely want to talk about the podcast too. So maybe tell us a little bit about your background and then we'll kind of go back into talking about podcasting. And you mentioned like partition. Yeah. So you, you can go yeah. back in time even prior to your, to your birth if you're, if you're comfortable doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I was born in actually Multan, Pakistan. Oh. So a lot of people actually don't know that. So I was born in Multan, but when I was about four months or so my family had relocated to vancouver so my father was already living there um but my mother my mother's side was completely in pakistan and um ever since then i had essentially you know i had gone back when i was two for a couple of months but since then until i was 20 um, i had never been back at all and 
I think this is, uh, and the reason why I think this is so important is because I think a lot of Muslims living in the diaspora can relate to this, where there is this identity crisis that forms, where there's this, quite, especially in the teenage years of who am I? You know, am I Pakistani or whatever, whatever country you're from? Am I Canadian? Am I American? Um, I'm Muslim at the same time. But what is like my primary identity? And throughout the entirety of uh, my high school period, I had that identity crisis. Right? I wasn't really sure. And, you know, y y you're much older than I am. But it, when 9-11 when happened, um, I was only a couple years old. Mm. Right. And but by the time I got to high school, um, so this is about 2008, 2009, that's when I started seeing, you know, the discrimination that Muslims face. And, you know, as growing up as a young child, you know, when you read the, media, uh, the news, when you start hearing about Pakistan and Afghanistan, all these horrible things, it makes you realize, like, these people are crazy. And so for me, you know, my mother would always go back to Pakistan every year. And she'd always ask me, do you want to come? Right? And I'm the oldest of my brothers. And so my response would always be that, no, if I go, they're going to kill me. And so every year she would ask the same, because I would just keep seeing what, what the news would say about Pakistan. And my immediate response would be, keep those people away from me. Mm. And so when my mom's family would call her, my grandfather, my grandmother, um, my cousins, and my mom would say, speak to them. My response would be, I don't want to speak to them. These are crazy people. And that was all informed by, you're saying, by media yeah. and pop, popular culture? Okay, interesting. And then, all, and then obviously, you know, people see media and then they impose it on Muslims as well. So my high school, throughout high school, you know, I, I had a substitute teacher who walked into class one day and he said, he was doing attendance and he saw my name and he, he read it out. And I said, here, he said, because uh, my name is Ahmed, he said, oh, um, do you mean Ahmed the terrorist? The teacher said the that. The teacher said that, wow. substitute teacher. I'm, I'm surprised because you were telling me this is Vancouver, BC. This is Vancouver. Where, which, you know, I'm familiar with Canada. Vancouver is very diverse, right? But uh, this, this is prior to the whole progressive campaign. Like when it, when it was completely uh, immoral to, you know, to condemn anybody. Like my brothers right now are in school and just if a teacher said that, they would be fired. Mm. But for me growing up, there was still, it was still, because, you know, at that time, the U.S. was still in Iraq. They were still in uh, Afghanistan. And, you know, there was all these things happening in Pakistan. So it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily wrong. Moral, it wasn't considered morally wrong to say that to a student. And it was, and I, there, I mo the moment I realized that is when all the students started laughing at me in the class. And I realized like, okay, you know what? Maybe this is an aspect of my identity I want to completely throw away. Mm. So are, are there, were there, was it not a very diverse high school? Like, cause I oh, it was like, extremely diverse. Yeah. I mean, the city that I am from specifically, those who know Vancouver, I'm from Surrey and Surrey is 50% Sikh. Mm -hmm. And my school itself was about, about 80% Sikh. Mm -hmm. So it was diverse, but even the Sikh students, you know, were making fun of me. Like it just, it just had reached a point where it was just, everybody was just coming after the Muslims, especially when you have an easy name like Ahmed, right? And it's, and it's easy to identify, you know, I, I kept getting this and I kept seeing the media and I said, you know what? I don't, I don't want anything to do with these people, meaning like the Pakistanis. Because mm -hmm. I'm like, these people are crazy. You have two Ahmeds in this room. Like that's my last name. And uh, for, for listeners, my <laughs> daughter is listening in on us doing a live recording and her name is also Ahmed. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, my middle name, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And Omar, sorry, I forgot. That's right. Omar's middle name. Um, so we can share your pain. You know, it's interesting. I, 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 first of all, I'm just shocked to hear that because for me, uh, yeah, like you said, um, and I don't, I, I wasn't offended when you said I'm much older than you, which I am, but anyway. <laughs> I, I meant in wisdom. <laughs> I meant in wisdom. I'll make that clear. Omar even gave me a side eye. Like, are, 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 are you, are you cool with him saying that we're that much older? Because <laughs> me and Omar are certainly of the same vintage. Uh, although Omar is a couple years younger than I'll, me. I'll take that year and a half. Uh, that, <laughs> there that, you that, go. That, that you got on me. <laughs> Savor it. Savor it. Exactly. Um, but 9-11, of course, very, very, I mean, I, I remember it vividly. And, you know, what was remarkable, and it was funny because I was just t speaking with, um, you know, someone about this, uh, well, I'll just say a, a Zaytuna faculty member about this last week. And, and we were talking about how in the days that followed after 9-11, how 
it was remarkable the outpouring of support and you know uh, the welcoming nature of the American people and what that meant and coming from the top down. I mean, you know, for all of his ills and flaws, George Bush, you know, certainly went out of his way to sort of sort of quell any kind of you know attitudes like that. Um, and I was in Texas, and mm -hmm. you know, like my wife, uh, you know, I remember. You know, she, you know she, she she wearing the hijab and she she had a hair appointment, um, and I remember her hair appointment like her hairdresser calling her after nine eleven, saying you know I, I know you're not scheduled or anything like that, but I just want you to know that you're you know you know uh, we'd love to see you and we want to know that you're safe and we welcome mm -hmm. you and all of that stuff right so just I, th th that just comes to mind. And I think the overwhelming, of course, there were isolated, there, there were certainly instances of Islamophobia, and we begin to see, we, we began to see a lot of that. But what was interesting is in at least the days, and I would even argue the, the, the couple of years after, hmm. it wasn't the kind of heightened and, and organized Islamophobia that we see today. And certainly, I think, in the time frame that you're speaking of. Um, because so now that, there's a whole sort of industry. Well, that's what that's yeah. what I think Ahmed is yeah. pointing out from the timeline. Like yeah. he's a baby that's at, right. in nine eleven. So he's right. not get. He's not seeing that. Mm -hmm. He's that's, seeing kind of the post aftershock. Exactly. Once things have settled and the Islamic Islamophobia industry is actually starting to Absolutely. grow. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I mention is because I think it's, I think it's important for people to remember that or to know that. You know, for people who are young, for example, I, I tell my kids this about uh, you know, or my wife and I tell our kids this all the time about how. That was the case after 9-11. That was the environment. It wasn't this environment of like hatred and you had to watch your back. And of course, again, were there instances? Of course. But overwhelmingly, you're right. Um, it was outpouring of support. Uh, you know, Sheikh Hamza himself was at the White House, mm -hmm. spoke to the president, et cetera. So, so you know, uh, but, and, and to, to, to find that in, in, in what I would consider or characterize as a liberal enclave like Vancouver, that really is shocking. Yeah. Because um, I'm, I'm from like Texas. So, you know, I mean, so I, and so for me, you know, I, I would see it, it, like if you to, if you told me that happened to you in like, you know, Podunk, Texas, or even a school in a certain part of Houston, I, I would believe that, you know, mm -hmm. just find it shocking that that kind of attitude yeah, was but, uh, but prevalent. I also want to make sure that people understand that it wasn't like it wasn't like the norm that this was happening every day. It was just kind of like these are these are stories that stick out. Right, mm -hmm. but it's the stories that stick out that matter mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. sit in your consciousness. Oh yeah, and so uh, you know, for me, w w when I reached the age of twenty, um, it was a very crucial age in my life for a number of reasons. Um, it was also the year, you know, I, you know, it was the year I kind of became acquainted with Malcolm X, and that really was like the starting point, kind of behind ev behind almost everything. Mm -hmm. Um, the complete trajectory of my life. And I think one of the reasons is, you know, um, when you're 19, you're like, people are telling you, you know, you, you need to start taking life serious. You're, you're like, I'm only 19. But the moment you hit 20, it's like, okay, wow. Like, I got to get my stuff together. I hope my daughter's listening because she's sitting in the room and she's uh, about to turn 20 next month. So <laughs> <laughs> take it from, yeah, take it from someone who's been there, right? I'm a, yeah. Right. And so for me, when I reached 20, um, my mother had told me that our whole family was going to Pakistan. Oh, to go visit. To go visit right, right. all together. Mm -hmm. And there was no way I could say no at this point. And so I'd, all, of my, all of my brothers had gone. And they had all told me about their wonderful experiences. But there was, I guess, whether you want to call it like a minor trauma or so forth, um, it was sitting in my consciousness like, I, I don't really know what's going to happen. And so I was quite terrified when I was going. And... When I landed there, you know, it's like it's like that scene you see like in Bollywood movies, or it's like the image you have when you land at the airport that you have the whole family waiting for you. Right. And so as I land, I, I and I and I go through. Uh, uh, first of all, when I get there, um, you know, there's like some security issues and so forth. But then um, the man looks at me and he, you know, in Urdu he says, you know, like uh, like aap uh, hamara bacha hai, like you know, you are a son. And I was like, I've never met this man before. Like, why would he say something so kind to me like that? Yeah. And then, like, as our stuff, as our luggage was going through the detector, there was, like, some error and there was, like, something in my bag. And he said, don't worry about them. Just just let them go. Mm. Right? That was my first interaction. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe there's something to this. Nice. Maybe everything I've been told was a lie. 
and I get there and the whole family is there. And these are people I've basically never seen in my life. Right. My own grandfather, grandmother, my cousins. And as I've never I'm, seen it sounds like minimal interest as a kid, right? Yeah. And then and almost like a level of kind of like hatred mm-hmm. in your heart. Because you're like, these people are the reason why I'm going through my problems. Yeah. Like right. if you guys just got your act together, <laughs> my life would be so much easier. So true. Right, right. But the moment I get there, you know, uh, there's just all this love and affection that's shown to me. And I begin to realize, like, you know, this narrative that I've been taught my whole life was actually false. And, you know, I go on this entire journey throughout Pakistan, um, beautiful journey, which I, I documented actually in a book, which I hope to publish sometime soon, inshallah. Um, just documenting all my travels, all the places I've been, and just having this you know this cognitive dissonance of mm-hmm. knowing of realizing that you were wrong and then also developing a little bit of anger towards that industry because i mean it made me realize that they took 20 years away from away from me from my family that for 20 years i did not know my family for 20 years arguably i hated them mm-hmm. And their names, you know, they'd always message me on Facebook or, you know, they say such beautiful things to me. But my immediate response was, you know, I don't want to talk to you at all. And so it made me realize, you know, at that moment, and as I'm sitting there with my grandfather and he's telling me all these stories of partition, right? Things, you know, maybe I've read about in the books, but, you know, that that, that one-to-one story, that experience of this is how I survived the partition. This is how I had to flee all the dead bodies that I saw growing up all of the atrocities, the burning of houses and so forth, and just not knowing if I was going to make it safely, if I, if I was going to end up being one of those bodies. Mm. And, you know, when they arrived, you know, they've, you know, the Muhajirs didn't have anything, many of them. They had left their homes. They had left much of their wealth. And they didn't know if they were going to make it, yeah. right? And I think that's one thing we right now, we have we have hindsight, right? Because hindsight's always twenty twenty, So we can kind of look back and say, Oh, things would have been fine, but they didn't know. No, they're they're, they're staring into an uncertain future. Um, absolutely. You, you know what? What's really interesting is uh, obviously this is not the first time that, I, that that I've heard someone share their own you know family stories about the partition. But uh, as, as as at least for Omar and I, who come from Indian descent, you know, I, I think th- it's less common. Let's put it that way to 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 find. Uh, uh, p- partition narratives in Indian families, obvious for obvious reasons, and the only reason I, I I call attention to that is because I think it's 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 fascinating because it's not a Indo it's not a subcontinent experience. It's very much an experience that is more commonly found among people who migrated to Pakistan or mi- migrated to what would later become Bangladesh. Mm-hmm. So I, I find that fascinating because I mean, it, it, like growing up, we—I di- I don't know about you, Omar. I mean, and I—I I don't think I'm speaking for myself when I say this. Like, as someone coming from Indian background, we didn't grow up listening to partition horror stories. It was mm-hmm. something that I, you know, knew about theoretically and read about in history books, but the, never. Yeah, know. the interesting thing yeah. is, I mean, we have a lot of relatives that ended up going to. Karachi from both sides, but I think That's they true. went kind of at quote unquote peaceful times. That's whether right. It was the seven sixties. Mm. It 70s. wasn't at that crucial that, that yeah. crucial moment. You're absolutely right. I mean, in fact, me and Omar share relatives who are in and settled in Pakistan, but they yeah they went at a time where it was, and and, and they left. I think it was more voluntary. It was yeah, more yeah. voluntary. Yeah. But the stories that Ahmed I think is, is speaking of of you know of being you know you know basically kicked out of your home and and you know not knowing where you're going to end up and then having to flee. I mean, those are stories that I, that I, that, you know, that, that I find are unique to the Pakistani immigrant mm-hmm. experience or the mm-hmm. Bangladeshi immigrant experience. I mean, I don't know if you would agree with that. You know? I, I, just, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty, I mean, it, it makes sense right? because I mean, the people who are on the front lines are the ones who remember the memories most. That's right. That's right. right. And it's, it, it's quite interesting mm-hmm. because, you know, I think I think a lot about my ancestors, mm. you know, uh, especially you know I think, and the the other aspect also uh, of me growing up because of seeing those things about Pakistan, is I didn't want anything to do with my Pakistani identity. Mm. So so growing up there was nothing about me that was Pakistani at all except for the food I ate 
and maybe the clothes I would wear at on Eid. Okay. Aside from that, I really wanted nothing to do with it. So I think my reaction to kind of figuring everything out was to go into like the polar opposite direction to kind of make up for the, the missed year. So, so I, I started to embrace that Pakistani identity. And with that, you know. How was the, if you don't mind me asking, mm -hmm. like, what about the religious identity side of things? I mean, did you grow up in a pretty religious family? Not so much. I mean, if, it was if a very religious family. Sure. Okay, okay. And I had spent uh, about um, close to twelve years in madrasa. Mm. Oh, okay. Uh, memorizing okay, wow. Quran. Got it. So in Canada, so, yeah. Were you as a kid saying, "Yeah, I love, I like, I like being Muslim, but I don't want to be one of like cultural. I want to, I want to shed the culture and be like a pure." Was it that narrative or was it something else? Yeah, I find that fascinating, and that, which is why I asked the question. Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to probe because I, that dichotomy fascinates me where you mm -hmm. were a very practicing Muslim, I mean, studied in madrasa, but on the other hand, rejected the cultural part of being Muslim. Because the interesting thing yeah. about Pakistani culture is that Islam is so ingrained within the culture that it's so hard to tell the difference between the two sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's just so ingrained because... Obviously, the, the country was created solely for Muslims. Mm -hmm. like, like, I mean, the purpose was for Muslims, right? To create a Muslim country. And with that, obviously, comes uh, Islam. And so for many Pakistanis today to, to have problems with Islam is almost to have problems with your own culture. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting relationship between or the two. Or vice versa. Right? Yeah, or vice versa. You know, it's interesting. I did not have that strong of a kind of a um, experience in terms of rejecting culture and, and then coming back to it that you did. Um, but I could definitely relate because I was like, as a kid, I would say like, and even, I would say even until relatively recently, I would just be like, focus on the religion, focus on the religion. But I think as I get older, it's, you know, you know, you add it to the long list of things you realize when you get older <laughs> and have kids and whatnot, you realize that those, they're, they're really like two very complement culture. It's oh, like absolutely. Islamic culture mm -hmm. and Islamic like practice, like the faith, the deen part of it. It They're almost like glue and, and tape, right? They're, they both have mm -hmm. use in putting something together. Um, it's probably a better analogy, but they, act, <laughs> they offer like the one-two punch, right? Mm -hmm. Um and 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 because there's sometimes where some people certain aspects of deen will lift you up on a particular day other people it may be a cultural mo a cultural just moment or experience that in that moment reconnects you mm -hmm. yeah. and, but they're very complementary i'm realizing realizing that as a as a dad and mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. now in <laughs> in my uh, in my 40s for me it was more you know, I mean, and i and 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 which is why i find you know, your experience so unique, I mean, like fascinating, Ahmed, because it, for me, it was more about like separating between and not for the sake of rejection, but for the sake of identification, like what is Indian culture, Hyderabadi culture, mm -hmm. if you will, and what is, is what is true Islam or what is Islam. Mm -hmm. But I think to Omar's point, and that's a very, I would argue, immature way of looking at things. I think maturate with maturation comes this idea that yeah they go hand in hand yeah and 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 and, and they are very very complementary and, yeah yeah so sorry i no no i you agree you know the, the, the and that's why islamic law always talks about like a lot of like that's custom right. that's right and now it's a valid source of law that's right but for me well, despite going through you know madrasa for, for that long uh, i had known i was muslim but you know the, the faith had not penetrated the heart Right. There's a certain point for every Muslim where, you know, you know, you may you may grow up as a Muslim, but there's that moment where it really penetrates and you're actually doing it like out of your own volition. Absolutely. Rather than your parents. Mm -hmm. And so for me, prior to, I think, 1920, it was still an Islam that was predicated on my parents telling me we needed to do this. OK, it's, it's time for Salah and so forth. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't really that I wasn't actively searching out for Islam and so forth. So when I when I when I went to Pakistan at that point I had already become somewhat more religious and I I was reading about Islam and so forth, but it really got me thinking deeply about my ancestors, and um, you know there's there's a beautiful saying from one of my greatest authors Malcolm X rahimahullah, uh, and interestingly enough my uh, my honors thesis was actually on Malcolm X, mm. it was actually a rewriting of Malcolm X's conversion to Sunni Islam. Ah. Uh, in which I argued he became so he clearly became Sunni Muslim before Hajj, For and we sure. have the picture of his shahada. But 
you know, I would argue because uh, when I was writing the honors, I was a thesis. I was looking at many of the different academic articles, and nobody had actually written an article like that about his journey to Sudan in 1959 and when that, when all of that begins. And a lot of this is new information coming out from you know Ahmed Usman, who was a Sudanese student, um, and so forth. But Malcolm X said, "You can't hate the roots of a tree and not end up hating the tree itself." Mm. Mm. Right. You can't hate the roots of a tree and not end up hitting the tree itself. And his message to the African-American community at that time was, if you hate yourself, if you hate your origins, it's basically like hating yourself. Right. Self-hate. And so for me, yeah. you know, reading that and understanding the hatred I had for Pakistan and Pakistani people and so forth, it made me realize that, okay, I need to remove this hate and replace it with love and just try to study just study the history of my ancestors right. and see what they went through for me to be where i am at today and one of my uh one of my closest uh friends once told me he said quote our ancestors we are our ancestors wildest dreams mm -hmm. i love that yeah and you know it, the reason why i think it's so profound is because even today you know i, I was i was walking through uh berkeley and i was thinking of this quote and I was like, you know, if my great grandfather, even my grandfather that passed away, Allah um, saw me today and just saw the life I was living, you know, he would be so happy. And one of the one of the most uh, beautiful things somebody has ever said to me in my life is um, I was one day speaking to my grandmother, and uh, growing up, my grandfather would always take me to madrasa, and he's a very devout religious man, and he said, you know. I want to have, you know, one of my grandsons memorize the Quran. Mm. And so he would drop me off every day to Madrasa, every day. To memorize. To memorize. He would just, he would tell my dad, no, I'm going to drop him off. Because he just really wanted to see it happen. But he passed away before it happened. And, you know, later, alhamdulillah, I finished memorizing my Quran. Um, and then I started, you know, delivering khutbahs and so forth. And my grandmother said to me, she said, you know, if your grandfather saw you right now, you know, he would be filled with tears of joy and just know that, you know, he is happy and he is proud of you and the work that you are doing. Mm -hmm. And to me, you know, you know, my grandfather lived a very difficult life. You know, he went through much hardship in Pakistan. He obviously went through the partition and then he also had to come to Vancouver. So you can imagine the shift from, from, from India to Pakistan and then Pakistan to Vancouver. And this was like the one thing that he wanted. And I just, like, like to me, this idea we have in our society today of like of being self-made i think is a completely erroneous claim because nobody is self-made everybody has thousands of thousands of thousands of people that they have to be grateful for for them to even be in this position and like on a daily basis we have to be grateful for at least 10 20 30 people um just just to facilitate this podcast there, there had to have been dozens of people you know, uh, you know, for me getting approval for us to be here, you right. know, just all this. And for so, sure. you know, that's why I believe, you know, one of the things that really struck out to me about Islam, one of the things that really struck uh, struck out, and for me, is one of the one of the biggest pillars that I hold on to in Islam is the idea of gratitude. Yeah. Like of shukr, mm -hmm. of just recognizing that, you know, Allah says, وَإِن تُعُدُّ نِعْمَةُ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا That if you tried counting the blessings of Allah you never could, right. right? And if you just try counting all the people you have to thank just for you to get here, you know, you, we would never even get here. And so for me, as I began to grow older um, and as I began reading about all, you know, I, I read so much history in my undergraduate. I read so much, almost, you know, every continent I had you to read a lot. Major, you yeah, said, I was right? a history major. But on this specific period of, of, of Pakistan, I was completely ignorant. Mm -hmm. And it bothered me. Because I said, how am I going to study everybody else's history with the exception of my own personal families? And so what we did, and this is something that Imam Zaid Shakir uh, informed us to do, informed everybody to do, is he said everybody should try documenting their family's history mm -hmm. so that their children have an idea of where they came from, what their ancestors had to go through. And the way we responded to this, my cousin, he sat with our grandfather and he recorded, I believe, 10 to 12 podcasts 
just about our family's entire history. Well, not I mean, at the time, not podcast, but he just recorded his no, sharing the podcast. His story. Who recorded? I'm sorry, your grandfather? No, no, my, my, my cousin with my grandfather. Oh, sir. oh wow. Yeah, okay. so my cousin sat with my grandfather for, I think, 12 hours, and they just kept recording, and he yeah. wanted everything. Can people listen to it? I mean, is it It's not out yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just like, it's like a database. I, inshallah, one day I want I want to write okay. all of it. So that's what I meant about yeah. it not being a podcast. You you, you did like it's an oral recorded. history. Yeah. Wonderful. We Wonderful. did an oral history because- My, 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 my father, you know, mm-hmm. and he was passed away, you know, God bless him. Um, also very much, you know, was of that spirit. Like he would sit down and record with like his elders and his, uh, people, uh, even his age. Mm -hmm. But now that's like this documented oral history that, that is no one else in the family has. Yeah. And you've been, Perez, you've been, uh, you've we've been talking about doing that with our family as well. Yeah. I mean, for sure, for sure. Actually, you know, like the drive up here, Omar and I were reminiscing about the time that we came with his father because his father came here for his master's, right? For his mm-hmm. master's to Berkeley in 1964. 64. So imagine that, uh, you know, in terms of we are on ground that has been traversed by exactly, um, you know, generations of people. Um, and so, you know, we, when we, when we brought him here on his most recent visit and you remember the exact address of his two apartments and, you know, where he first landed and the first dinner he had. And this is a great memory. And I said, like, Omar, we, we, we have to have him on the podcast. Like, mm-hmm. you know, again, if for nothing else, just to capture that amazing, capture his story, let alone, I think, the insights that he could share with coming here in 1964 when the Bay Area had maybe, you know, I think 50, like, I think 50 Muslims, 25 families or something, you know. Uh, anyway, so, yeah. So I completely concur. That's amazing. I, I, I think if your cousin doesn't you should definitely put that to uh you know make that a project my cousin's also uh right. he's also a fil- film director oh wonderful. so you know he's gonna he's gonna make this <laughs> you know he's gonna get a grant he just is, it, wait, is, is this somebody we we uh, should be uh, keeping our uh, <laughs> our eyes open yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely yes yeah. He, he's in la he's a he's a remarkable fil- film director wonderful um young and upcoming but um yeah can you, can you share his name or yeah abu Bakr khan uh-huh. um he's a ceo of a uh, diaspora creative and so he has a number of different films he's working on. Just an interesting thing about him is he also, um, he he's actually one of the films he's working on is of uh, um, of an individual named Maharaja Ranjit Singh, okay. who is the founder of the only Sikh empire in history based in Lahore. Hmm. So he went to Lahore. He had his entire film crew come with him. Wow. And uh, they've been working on this remarkable, remarkable um, documentary um on his life and the type of empire he created and even if you go to lahore and you go to the the badshahi masjid they have like a whole section on him they have like an artifact of his horse and all his swords and so forth so um he was a great man and so forth but he, my cousin understood the importance before i even told him he, he he had taken the initiative and he said we need to document our history because the business of storytelling yeah. is the business that Muslims need to be in. Agreed, agreed. Um, so I guess that, like, so what was the impetus then moving closer to where we are today? Um, pers- I mean, you, you you talked about what inspired you to do the podcast, um, but was it anything beyond you know again wanting to share these stories, engaging in these conversations? And and was it yeah. um, was it before or after you came? To oh. Berkeley, and and for the listeners, we've alluded to the fact that we're at Berkeley. You've you've quoted Sheikh Hamza, <laughs> and Imam but we have and Imam Zaid, but we haven't uh, explicitly said you, you're a student uh, at Berkeley, yeah. uh, at Zaytuna College, I should say. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, what was that? Was that prior to you coming here? Right. I mean, so, that, like, in terms of the timeline that I know, I think it is. So I had um, I had attended I had did my undergrad at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. Okay. Um, and, you know, the university atmosphere is a very fascinating atmosphere, especially for a Muslim, because, um, you know, I work with many different MSAs, you know, I'm like Stanford MSA, Cal MSA, many of the ones in Vancouver. And one of the, th- one of the things I've realized is that the university is really a very, a very crucial moment in one's life. Mm. Even in, if, we all, if we ponder upon our own life, oh, for sure. the university time, you can either go completely one way or the opposite way. Mm-hmm. And so I've seen devout Muslim. I've seen people come to university and 100%. leave devout Muslims. Hundred percent. Yeah. Or I've seen people come in or leave Islam. Yeah. Conversely. Right. So 
one of the things, so when I was in university, I was kind of in that peculiar state where I was, I had not established what side I was on. I was Muslim. I was praying, right? And, I, you know, I had memorized the Quran, but there was still not, that, that Iman had not entered, mm-hmm. right? Into the heart where, you know, I, I really wanted to learn more. And so um, I was blessed, you know, just one Ramadan, you know, Allah just changed everything. I don't know where it came from. There's a beautiful saying of one of our great scholars, Ibn Atayla, who said that, uh, it's one of my favorite quotes, he said, if you don't think that God can't change you in one moment, then you know nothing about God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I really felt that just that something had happened in that one month. I had not done anything differently, but something had just happened where all of a sudden now, the only thing that was on my mind was Islam and my relationship with God. And, and you know, Ramadan had ended. And I, 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 for me, I was like, okay, maybe this is going to be like, you know, maybe I'm just a Ramadan Muslim, right? As, as, as many Muslims are. And there's nothing wrong with that. But as the month ended, I was still in the same routine. And I was like, subhanAllah. And it was like, it was like at that moment where I realized that that was not me. That was from Allah. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, like, in, you know, that book is by Ibn Atayilad, the aphorisms, I think is just, is, is, is a remarkable, phenomenal book just on how your relationship with you, with Allah, and just Qadr, divine decree. And he just, through his aphorisms, he'll always show you, like, you are on this path, but know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who directs the path. And you're just control, you're just on the roller coaster. And you can control your response, but at the end of the day, when the road is turning right, and you want to go straight, you just have to follow the road. Have you- have you, I'm just curious, because it came to mind, have you read Dr. Jackson's translation and, and annotation? Of the aphorisms? Yeah. No, we're, we're reading in Arabic. Oh, you yeah, know, I know. But, but I, haven't, I haven't read the English, no. Yeah, yeah but it's, it's more than just a translation, okay. right? It, it's, it's an annotated um, analysis of, of the aphor, mm-hmm. a, a, aphorism. So definitely okay. worth reading, okay. I, I, definitely. I, would, I, would, I would say. Um, uh, but uh, so, 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 so... So then what happened at university is... As, as what happens to most Muslim students is they come across the MSA. And for me, uh, you know, I entered the MSA and there was, for me, I, I like the social dimension of it. But, you know, within a month or so, I re- they had appointed me as the president because they had nobody else there. Everybody else had like co-op or something. And I, I really didn't feel qualified. But... At sometimes you just some at some point in life you realize that you know you're not making the decision because Allah has already made the decision for you, and I had realized that okay this is like this decision's done you can you can disagree with it but it's done, and so from then on forward as I became the head of an organization you know then you begin planning many different events organizations you bring in many reputable scholars from outside. And as I was having a lot of this one-to-one relationship with many of them, and they were, you know, they were motivating me, they were informing me, you know, we need more Muslims um, engaging in many of these discourses. We need more Muslim leaders. It just slowly kind of built up mm-hmm. day by day by day. Um, and who are some of the scholars that, that that you encountered? One scholar you might be aware of is um, he used to be in the Bay, Imam Yama Niazi. He used to, he was a student of Sheikh Hamza. He used to be uh, more in South uh, SoCal, I believe. Okay. Um, but Imam Zaid Shakir um, had entered my life. Um, he had come to my house, and I was his chauffeur driver. Um, so I was able to uh, drive him around. He that's when he initially pitched the idea of Zaytuna. Mm. He's For you like, to attend to me. Yeah, yeah. He's just like, look, you know, th- this is an option that's there, and I'm there. Um, and then. Um, He's, you know, doing, he's doing his job well, which is recruiting. So alhamdulillah, yeah. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Allah bless you, Imam Zaid. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a, a really fascinating, and so I was involved with the MSA, but a very fascinating, crucial moment in my life is um, there was an Islamic uh, Islamic studies uh, one-week intensive in Malaysia. And, um, you know, one of my teachers had attended previously, and I decided that, you know, this is something I wanted to attend. And my, my, the goal of my life was always law school after my undergrad. Always, without a doubt. But the day I arrived there, I had found out that Sheikh Hamza Yusuf was going to be speaking at that school to, to my program. Even and I, and I landed a day early. 
but he just so happened to be there. And so when he was there, you know, I made sure to meet him. Because you were already familiar with him. Yeah, I was already familiar with him. And um, as I was speaking to him, he also invited me to come to Zaytuna and so forth. And, um, you know, he had left. And I was speaking to one of my teachers and he said, you know, what do you want to do post your undergraduate degree? And I said, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, maybe going to Zaytuna College. And he said a statement to me, which was perhaps one of the most, maybe top 10 profound things I've heard in my life. And he said, don't think that it is a coincidence that you met Sheikh Hamza and Imam Zaid. This is Allah's way of showing you this is the direction you need to be going in. These are the signs and you need to follow the signs. Mm. And it was at that moment I had made my decision. Nice. Because I, I, I was a firm believer of just of Qadr. And that there is no such thing as coincidences in people's lives. And I said, and you know, sometimes, you, you know, Sheikh Hamza, uh, you know, he recently said, he said, you know, the name of the religion is Islam, which means submission. Right. And he said, so we are submitting ourselves to God. And I was, th- what I was thinking about is, you know, in today's age, especially with all this, you know, philosophy and so forth, people really struggle with the concept of Qadr, mm. of destiny. How can I do anything if everything is already predestined? Is, do I not have any free will and so forth? But to me, it's such a beautiful concept because it's not something that you're supposed to struggle with. It's something you're supposed to just submit to. Right? This is just the Qadr. We, we obviously affirm that we have free will. But when you just begin to see in your life that everything is just a way of, you know, you're on just you're on this roller coaster. You begin to realize that you begin to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything. In the fact that you know that you know, sometimes you know we have this uh, we have this word where we call epiphany, right? Where somebody says something to us and we say, SubhanAllah, I really needed to hear that. But sometimes I feel like that's Allah's way of speaking to you, is He will speak to you through other people. That's right. I mean, we we believe in um, extra, like, if you will, revelatory experiences mm-hmm. that are beyond. Like, revel- revelation is the the the, the sole purview of nubuwa, of prophethood. However, like things like ilham, mm-hmm. and there are other things in our tradition where we get intuition, mm-hmm. uh, and so epiphany could be intuition. Mm-hmm. That you know, and all of it is divine. All of it, and, and from even Allah. in the ayat. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ بَصَائِرُكُمْ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ That's right. That there has come to you these basair. Yeah. Right? Shaykh Hamza, I asked him about this and I said, could this mean like these like these, like these, these epiphanies or like these, like, like ilham? And he said, yes. Yeah. People call it, uh, what is it? Um, you know, deja vu. De- deja right? vu. Yeah, yeah. Deja vu. So, I, if I'm going to, if you, Omar no, no, looked like it. he wanted to ask a yeah. question. So, I'm going to turn the table, the tables a little now. So, um, now we're on your podcast mm-hmm. because this was meant to be kind of like this interesting kind mm-hmm. of cross pollination, right? So I, I want to I want to have you be equal parts guest and be equal parts host. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna you know uh, take off my hosting uh, hat and give it to you now. Uh, and so if we were on your podcast, I'd be curious what would what you would want to talk about. For me, storytelling. Okay, and that's that's funny because I was really thinking about that. That's kind of the theme for today is storytelling. Like he's yeah. he's you're, he has sure. a, he's telling well, stories, a, and we 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 try to you know showcase I, I, stories. I, well, I would argue that's been kind of the theme of all of our podcasts. Yeah. Right? We, we we like our guests to tell their stories. Yeah, but we you know it's not it's not all too often that we have a fellow podcaster, if you will, you know to turn the tables on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like I wouldn't do this to like you yeah know, Imam yeah. Zaid. <laughs> I, I will do it to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. So what I will begin with, um, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf once said that, um, and I'm paraphrasing that, every single person, their life is an incredible story. Mm-hmm. Every single human being. They just need the best, you know, authors or writers to write about it. And, you know, hearing that for me was, uh, and this will obviously lead to a question, but for me it was very phenomenal because I had to reflect on my father's life, you know, my mother's life, you know, my grandfather's, just my siblings. And I'm like, everybody has such a phenomenal life. Everybody has a phenomenal story to tell. 
And you could just sit there for hours just listening to every single person's story and having new insights and having a new level of respect for them. Because the beauty of a format like this and of telling stories is that many people actually don't share their stories at all. And they're always hidden. So for me, when I listen to both of you know the Diffuse Congruence podcast, and I'm listening to these phenomenal stories of these remarkable human beings, the question that comes into my mind then <laughs> is I want to hear the stories of the interviewers, <laughs> of the podcasters. Sure, sure. Because for them to embark on such an ambitious endeavor just shows that, you know, you know, sometimes you can just look in the eyes of a person and just know that they've gone through a lot, that they have a good story to tell. And I see that in both of your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's uh, I feel like, uh, well, that's a lot right there. Omer's, but, uh, Omer's eyes are post LASIK and my eyes are post cataract. So, we're, yeah. so I don't know what eyes you're looking into. We're looking into, we're looking into the metaphysics. <laughs> of course, of course. The I'm, metaphysics. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm making, I'm bringing it back full circle to you calling out our ages. Mm. Um, uh, but, uh, so we're so, so no, pervasive. It's, it's a fair question. Yeah. Um, so I always, def I, and I, I, I know I've said this on the show. So I, I describe myself um, unabashedly as the Muslim Forrest Gump. Um, I've been very fortunate to be in the company of some amazing individuals and be at the right place at the right time where I got the opportunity to meet with people that would fundamentally changed my life and would impact me and continue to impact me. Uh, and, and I also, the other parts, part of the Forrest Gump, and I'm not saying this with any kind of f trying to fall, uh, you know, feign any kind of uh, humility. Uh, you know, I'm not qualified to be with some of these people that I, that I, that I find myself in the company of, but yet Allah and the, you know, um, it, it was destined that I would be at those moments and meet the people that I have had the opportunity to meet. And, and, and the, so the podcast is very much an extension of that. You know, I don't have to, you know, by God's blessing, I'm one removed from almost all of the guests that we've had on the show. Like I can go directly mm -hmm. to the person. I'm, you know, uh, rarely, of course, you know, you have to coordinate with people's schedulers and so on. But, but more often than not, you know, I can just call in a favor as it were. Um, and I've been very lucky and, and blessed by Allah in, the, in that sense. So, um, you know, if you wanted a, like a short two minute version of my life story, I would say, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of the Muslim Forrest Gump. Um, and so I've been very blessed. I, I've, uh, you know, I mean, I, 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 I've peppered our conversation even today a little bit about my background. I mean, I'm from Texas, um, born and raised. I uh, spent the vast majority of my life there, but at a very young age, uh, I was actually 15, maybe maybe 15, 16 years old, I became heavily involved in the local youth group, and then through the youth group, I got involved with MINA, uh, and then through that ISNA, and then that really presented and opened up opportunities for me to meet some of the most amazing individuals that we are blessed to have in our community here in North America. Um, and so, um, you know, that's been, that's my sort of, the, you know, I, so I've been involved in the work as it were, you know, people mm -hmm. like to use the word, well, how long have you been in the da'wah? You know, well, I guess if you want to call it that, <laughs> <laughs> I've been in the da'wah since I was 15 years old. Sure. Uh, and, and I don't, I'm, I'm 48. I just turned 48 earlier la or last month. So, so, you know, I, I, so it's, it's been a, per, it's been a majority of my life. And, um, uh, you know, and it, like I said, I've been able to um, study formally with some of the people that I've spent time with. Um, and uh, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to have um, a wife and children and family that support me and, you know, have sort of tra traversed the path with me, especially my wife. Um, so, yeah, that that that's sort of me in a nutshell. I mean, I could probably go on, but yeah, that probably bored the audience. Unless you have a follow up or something you'd want to know. I have a follow up to both of you, so oh, sure, I, I, sure. I want to yeah, hear. Yeah. I want to okay. hear Omar's story yeah, now. So I'm I'm not in front of the in front of uh, uh, audiences or anything like that. So this this would be new to me. But you know, I'll give you I'll give you a little anecdote, and maybe that'll that'll be it. Um, so we went, when we went and visited uh, uh, Imam uh, Doctor Mozamo Siddiqui. Yeah. I just went because, you know, I, I wanted to go on a road trip with Berbez and, and I knew 
you know, I'm sure I knew it'd be an interesting conversation. Um, but I really walked away with, um, like a renewed sense of Iman, right? And so to me, that was worth it. Like, I'm not, I'm not that knowledgeable about Islam. I have horrible tajweed. I just do the best I can. What I do know is, like, I love Allah. I love Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if I can stay connected to Deen in any sort of way, mm-hmm. even if it's just through meeting good, most good people and be inspired, then I'll take it. So that's that's kind of it in terms of. Mm-hmm. The podcast, so, so I can't resist, and, and, and I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to j- jump in as host again, but ask a follow up to that is, and, and I, because I find that fascinating, because you, unlike the two of us, uh, you spent time in the days of Zaytuna Institute, yeah, you know, sitting at you know on, on you know on, on Jackson Street in Hayward. So I guess my question then is, you know, what was different about the experience that you had with Dr. Muzama Siddiqui? Um, it, it was similar. It was actually yeah, similar because... Yeah, but it, it was, had it, been a while, I guess. It had been a while. So, yeah. you know, I've, 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 we were talking about it up here. I've, I've probably sat and listened to Sheikh Hamza for hundreds of hours over the last oh. 20 years. Like I, in, in, by, you know, 631 Jackson, those Saturday, <laughs> Sunday courses, but I never took a class and never took like a official class and memorized a text or anything like that. So I always walked away with... Well, what I want, what what am I getting out of this? This is an entertainment, right? And I don't think I could like regurgitate the text or give you the the ruling or anything like that. But I always said, if I can walk away with seeing the world in that similar way, like that Islamic way, like seeing the world through that lens that somebody like a Sheikh Hamza sees the world, and because they're seeing it through gratitude through patience, through Allah's beauty, you know, the creation, the beauty of the creation, Rahma. Like that's what I tried to take in. Mm. Not so much I haven't been that successful in terms of like memorization and 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 you know fiqh and 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 classical text. Like I just hasn't for whatever reason hasn't um stuck. I mean, you know, I haven't followed up on it maybe, right? But um, but I, but I, I do want to like retain that essence, right? So if I, if hopefully, inshallah, some of that, some of that stuck on the heart, right? That's no, that's, that's my beautiful. Hope. I think that's, I think it's very beautiful. Sorry, yeah, yeah. You know, um, I feel like after attending many of these lectures, if I, I really believe that if the only thing you take away from the lecture, you don't remember anything that the scholar actually said. But you just left feeling good and feeling that you know you love Allah just a little bit more. Just mm-hmm. your iman just is a little bit stronger. I feel like it was completely successful. That's right. So you know the idea of you know not being able to regurgitate everything or just the fact that your iman was still there and it got a bit stronger, and you knew that you know, you know this this is God's religion. Uh, for me, that's more than enough, and I think that's a it's a very beautiful aspect that um unf- that I think some people unfortunately. They tend to think that you know I need to know all this information and I need to walk out with all of it. But in reality, if you just if the heart changes, that's that right. that's what really matters. Yeah, I mean, you know, like uh, so, so something Dr. Jackson likes to say is you know is Islam is not about information; it's about transformation. Okay. You know, and and that's exactly right. And 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 you know, I think what both of you are kind of alluding to, without maybe naming it, is is this is why in our tradition, equal to the pursuit of knowledge. Is the is the is the idea of sohba of of you know just sitting in the company of individuals who are more learned and you know arguably closer to Allah than we are, hmm. and that alone just you know there's nothing utilitarian right it's it, you know, me and Omar that's an inside joke sorry but it, it's just the essence of being in the company and the presence of these individuals that uh, whether or not you retain the knowledge that they may or may not pass on to you 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 leave with their essence like you leave with an essence that they you know inhibit mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's the beauty of whether it's a lecture or whether it's even just simply simply sitting and having tea with someone, um, you know, who is more learned and more experienced 
than the other per than, than than we are. So um, I I've come to really appreciate that as as I've gotten older, mm -hmm. you know, where it's not about retaining, you know, the information as much as it is like is that how 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 did that experience transform you? Well, you know, I think one of the beautiful aspects about Islam um, yeah. and many of the hadiths of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam are that you, they, they essentially say that you are you are with the people that you associate with. Oh, I thought you were going to say, because in, in hadith discord, what I find very, like, and very much to the point of what we're talking about is hadith, like, if you study hadith, you, you, you don't just study hadith out of a text. You study hadith from a scholar. Because there are certain hadith where the ishara, like what the prophet gestured, is a part of the narration. Mm -hmm. And you don't get that in a book. Like you don't necessarily mm -hmm. get that in a text, but you will definitely get that if you learn from a scholar because that they're they're passing that on mm -hmm. to you, right? So that I thought. Sorry, I didn't. It's called. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would go. I would give it, an example. It, it, that's not the technical word for it. But if you, that exactly. Musalsal. The, musalsal it's, ahadith. Yeah, it's sorry. the same. It's the same reason. Like, hey, you know, I can listen to watch a YouTube video. It's not the same thing as sitting yeah. five feet away yeah. from yeah. someone. That's right. right. Because because the reason is that. Just being in the company of illuminated people, that light, some of that light comes off and it balances onto you. Yeah. And that's all you really need because some of these people, just that we, we have the great fortune of being around, are just, you know, they're walking away and they're just completely illuminated. And one of the reasons is because, um, like, many of the du'as of the Prophet ﷺ uh, center around the concept of light. There's a one very long, beautiful hadith. Allahumma ja'al fi qalbi nura, wa fi lisani nura, wa fi sam'i nura. That Allah grant me light in my heart, in my tongue, on top of me, on my right, left. Just it, This is a religion of light. Envelop and I, us. It, it envelop us in light. And we I had, think... Uh, we had uh, Aaron... Aaron Sellers yes. did that dua on the podcast. In about, fact, uh, just up the hill from here. Yeah, uh, I listened to it. We yeah. recorded yeah. it at the upper campus. Yeah, sorry. Very yeah. phenomenal human being. Beautiful, yeah, Beautiful human being, yeah. mashallah. But just being in the presence yeah. of these people, even if you don't retain anything, just, just the light balances off and that alone is sufficient for yeah, you absolutely. to walk. And, and some of these scholars, and I'm sure you've had the experience, just when they walk into the room, there is this like, there's this aura or just something just changes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, and Omar will tell you, I mean, to, sometimes to his chagrin, although Omar is a great, you know, uh, supporter, like he'll go along with the, with, with the ride, which is like, I'm, which is why I'm a believer in, in person recordings. Like as much as technology can assist us sometimes, even frankly, making the drive up to Berkeley, right? I mean, why do it? Let's uh -huh. just get on a, you know, Zoom call or what have you. No, 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 not, not for me. I mean, to me, you know, just being able to sit with people um, and, and and just you know sharing this, the, the being in a common space that, that there's a there's a magic there, there's a there's a mystery there, there's a there's a profundity there. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll I'll I will say, Pervez, you you do push for it, and yeah. sometimes I'm like, I know, oh man, that's gonna be tough <laughs> to pull off on a weekday, but then I never regret it. That's for sure. Oh. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, I, yeah. I have, I have a follow up please, question to both please. of you. Yeah. Um, and this, um, for me, you know, obviously I haven't been in the game as long as um, either of you, but one of the things that I found being in, in an industry that I love from the bottom of my heart, you know, this is an industry that I just like, I dedicate my spare time towards, you know, it's not something that there's like yeah. a, financial incentive or anything but can i ask you like because i i don't i'm only a passive listener of podcast and by that i mean you know if if, if mm -hmm. someone highly recommends an episode i'll check it out you know i don't do a deep dive so i i, I you, and please ask your question but i want i want to talk about the industry i want to i want to learn from you in terms of what you think about the industry as it were and by industry i'm assuming you mean muslim podcasting space Okay. Yeah. So, uh, because both of us do this as a, as a, or I should say all three of us do this as a passion project and not mm -hmm. as a, I, I, you know, out of some financial gain. Um, so I, I'd love to kind of talk mm -hmm. about that from you, like, uh, with you, but anyway, sorry that please ask your question, but I uh, keep that in mind though. Cause I, I do want to pick your brain. Yeah. Cause, cause it's essentially what, what I'm trying to get at is to both of you. And then I'll answer later is, 
why do you think you why do you think this industry is something that you love or why is it that you find so much i'm assuming you find a lot of meaning in doing this right because otherwise you wouldn't be in here for this long right pervasive <laughs> uh yeah like on a, on a wednesday night we have yeah uh after a, you know working our day jobs <laughs> no no for sure um I, I i'll just say and which is why I, I i quickly wanted to ask you that question because i don't know if i share your love of the industry i really don't hmm. i think i think there's a lot of noise out there i'll be really honest with you um and maybe this is just me being an old curmudgeon i don't know but i, I just find a lot you're, you're of, gonna have to ask him if, if the word curmudgeon is even <laughs> in his relevant in, in his vernacular yeah, exactly. in his vernacular but he's a learned person so I, I i shouldn't have to translate curmudgeon even though he's far from being one uh and you know may allah never make you an old curmudgeon okay. but um but you know and, and maybe yeah so maybe there's a little bit of that i, I just find it just there's just a lot of noise man so I, I just, I don't listen. I, I just do the show. And so by that, and then, which is why I wanted to pick your brain about the industry, as you called it, because I, I'd love to know like what your thoughts are and what's out there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, so, so I just... Uh, yeah, I, so I'm kind of, I wouldn't say I'm a heavy, heavy podcast listener, but I definitely listen to podcasts. I've, but how I've much, kinda, I, like Muslim podcast, let's just, let's just limit the conversation to Muslim podcasts. Yeah, pod and that's that's in the in the rotation if you're right. Okay, okay, sure, um, sure, sure. I, it's it's, you know, it's a way to just offer people resources. It's a resource that you're giving to people. Sure. Um, instead of them listening to the radio or, um, what have you, in some sort of other form of entertainment, it's like it's a it's a resource that's productive and beneficial. Inshallah, that's that's sure. that's, that's kind of the hope. Um, but I, I think I lean more towards you because I do it again more for my own personal interactions, like like you, like the experience of podcasting versus a consumer the, of it. creating yeah, yeah. versus creating the creator mm -hmm. of a library for other people. Right, right. Right. I do it for my own personal experience. Yeah. So, so to answer your question, I mean, very much so. I mean, I mean, finding meaning is an understatement. I mean, I, I find a lot of joy. I find a lot of. You know, I, I learn a lot and, and just, I just, I, I, yeah, I mean, I find a lot of joy just being able to sit with people and have them share their stories, do less talking and more listening and, you know, being able to ask and navigate the conversation, ask the right questions and navigate the conversation, but allow them to, um, you know, essentially be the driver, if you will. Uh, which is why we don't send, you know, we, we don't have, we usually have like a very, very loose outline when we do the show and uh, we don't have any pre pre arranged uh, questions. Mm -hmm. We don't share questions ahead of time, even though some of our guests ask um, and I've yet to, so when they ask, I usually reply or push back if you will and say, no, we like to keep the, you know, we, we like to keep the conversation organic and free flowing. We want, we want the listeners to feel as though they're like a fly on the wall and they're literally just kind of listening in on this conversation. So, um, and I've never had anybody push back and say, no, 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 I really need the, <laughs> I really need an outline or I really need to know what the questions are going to be. So alhamdulillah, like we've been blessed, um, with that people, you know, uh, come on for the ride as it were. Uh, so yeah, I mean, find Im immense joy and meaning in that, and 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 frankly, you know, if 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 through this podcast, if I'm able to introduce, and that's why what you said earlier on really touched me when you said that you weren't familiar with Dr. Mazlum Sadiqi until you heard the show. Like if 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 I'm doing that to the thousands of people that listen to the show, I'm introducing them to voices, to stories, to individuals who they may not be familiar with. And it's like a Wikipedia article, right? Where mm -hmm. you'll be like, oh, Muslim Siddiqui. Okay, now, so when the, I know the Isna and Natwatul Alama. And so now you're connecting, you know, you go down these rabbit holes of these on your, and mm -hmm. as a historian, you will, because that's how you consume history, which is, you know, oh, that's an interesting thing. I'll come back to it, you know, and then do a di deep dive into that particular part of it. So um, if I'm able to just do that and introduce people to, you know, the, the people that we have on the show, then that's the joy mm -hmm. that I find in doing it. And that's why I continue to do it. Well, the other thing is like, we've talked about this, uh, our scholars, do you remember when, when we were kids, our See? parents' scholars were like, ah, not for us. We need somebody more contemporary. And now as we're older, we that's been a theme of this mm -hmm. podcast is how, how old Parvez <laughs> and I are. But uh, as we get older, like, yeah. you know. 
for us, Sheikh Hamza, Sherman Jackson, Dr. Omar, right. like the younger generation may not even, probably doesn't even know who those people are. Right? I, and they and that's a great yeah. question because, or so, I'm so glad you kind of keep yeah. in that flow. Maybe it maybe somebody who's 20 listens to a podcast. They're Absolutely. like, who is this Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah yeah. or, and so on, right? And I've said this yeah. on many, many episodes that when all is said and done, even without like setting out to do so, for example, and, and Zaki used to call it the tapestry, right? Mm -hmm. He used to call these episodes. We have presented a tapestry by which, even though we haven't laid it out in a in, in a in a way where you know, like it, like it's like it's it's kind of like the Quran, where if you want to learn about the story of Musa, you know, Ali you like you, you I, I can't mention a chapter and verse. I can't mention a, even a chapter. You have to literally. I can mention to you, you know. Perhaps, you know, it, 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 it'll be like a smattering of verses throughout the Quran that tell you the story of Moses. It's not linear. And so, I, I you know, we have, we on the show now, alhamdulillah, like by doing it for nine years, I, we have extensively covered the story of Zaytuna Institute, for example, mm -hmm. into Zaytuna College without even, you know, setting out to do it. Why? Because we've had on the show, you know, Aaron Sellers, we've had on the show mm -hmm. Osama Cannon, we've had on the show, you know, Imam Zaid Shakir, and, and, and you know. Lo lots of if, if diffused believe, yeah. <laughs> episodes no, that are all congruent, if yeah, you will. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm knocking on, well, this isn't even wood, but I'm saying, inshallah, you know, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf one day. Inshallah. So, but, but, you know, but, but that's the beauty of it is that we are, because we've been doing it for so long, you know, we are tape, we are, you know, sharing a lot, we're shedding light on this beautiful tapestry without even setting out to do that. That's just, it's happened organically itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the, the, the reason I ask is because for sure. me personally, I realized when I started doing it, how much more meaning entered my life. Wow. And how much better it was because for me, because I was I was engaging on, you know, because I you know, I was very intellectually stimulated. I would choose a difficult topic. I choose a speaker, and then I would dedicate that whole week to just research. Yeah, it was like the only thing on my mind. And I was learning all these phenomenal things, and then I'd be sharing it with others, and other people would be you know mentioning their feedback and how much they loved it, and it just became like my life just became you know so much better. Yeah. But then, in certain moments of my life, where when I would pause it. I'd get to like a certain moments where I'd be like, something's wrong. I'm missing something. Yeah, there's yeah. just something about me that's just missing out there. That's great. No. I, I think just to uh, to bring it full circle as we get closer to wrapping, right? I think it all goes back to the power of storytelling. Yeah, storytelling has an immense power, and if you can be, you know, t be have a have a hand in that and, and be a storyteller, you'll 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 you'll, you'll you know, you'll you'll get it get a sense of that. I mean, to be honest, even at work, right? I I I I got a larger role recently, and that was the number one feedback that my boss had recently was, "Hey, you're not you're not you don't need so much to know the 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 technical anymore, mm. right? It's not about it's not about how many things you've fixed or how many solutions you put together. It really comes down to storytelling. Yeah. If you can master that at this that's, level, absolutely, that's what right. you need. That's how you're gonna like." not influence one or two people but the organization and beyond so it's 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 mm -hmm. really i i think the the power of it goes back to the power yeah. of storytelling it's it's immense i mean steve jobs right. was the master mm -hmm. storyteller that's why his technical product essentially changed the world not the, not just because of the, the product itself. because of the technology 100 100 percent. and and corporations are catching on i agree yeah. with you mm -hmm. the idea of like bringing in storytelling yeah. into the sales cycle into uh, I mean, as a lawyer, into in, into how you present a case. I mean, all of that. So it, it's it's uh, yeah, I, I agree, mm -hmm. and, and and I think we're touching into something that is primordial, um, because it, it, that is how our ancestors. You know, it was a lived tradition. It was a shared tradition orally. Mm -hmm. It was it was passed on from generation to generation orally, i.e., through storytelling. I think we've we've yeah. lost. A, I think. Oh yeah. I think. If we could get together and figure out how to help other Muslims, like are in our community or in the Ummah, like tell, get better at telling these stories, yeah. I mean that 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 makes such a difference because I think we've lost the art of telling the story. I mean, mm -hmm. even figurative and actually literally, right? Who, mm -hmm. where, where are the stories being told in Hollywood? Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So in actuality, from a 
film and, and television point of view, but just generally speaking, like I don't know how good we are at telling the story of Islam to our kids, for example. Mm-hmm. I don't know how good we are at telling the story to our neighbors who aren't Muslim. And mm-hmm. I think I think if we can get that mm-hmm. uh, that skill back, yeah. I think we're going to go a long way. And I th- I think as somebody who um, um, deciphers a lot of Muslim media content, movies, TV shows, I will say there are a number of very interesting TV shows slash movies um, that I would highly recommend. Because one of the things people always ask me, especially parents, is what ty- you know I want to watch TV with my children. Mm-hmm. But in today's age, you know, with all this, you know, degeneracy or so forth, I don't want to watch a TV show with any nudity Mm. with my children. So is there anything like Islamic or anything that I could recommend? And there are several options. Um, You know, I think I think because we live in an age where the entire industry is so um, is is filled with nudity, that's why something like Urtugal really took off. And became the most popular TV show on the planet, to a point where you know if if these characters in Urtugal go to Pakistan, yeah, yeah, they're recognized. Everybody, everybody dresses like people start dressing like them. They have like posters of them because what they're doing is they are reawakening the Islamic consciousness to a point where in Vancouver at our local Muslim uh, elementary school, uh, parents are coming to are approaching teachers. And they're saying, why are you not teaching our children about Ottoman history? Why are you not teaching them about Urtugal? Because it's the only thing they want to talk about. And then with Urtugal comes Islam. Mm -hmm. Because it's a very Islamic show, Islamic values. They're always quoting the Quran and so forth. And there's there's a very interesting movie that recently came out. Uh, I actually did a a podcast on this movie. And it became, uh, the, the title was a little bit controversial. So there was like a bunch of debate, but I called it um, creating Islamic anime because there was this uh, company in Saudi Arabia which paid uh, $15 million to the largest anime company in the world. And they said, we want to create our own Islamic anime. And so what they did is they took, it's called The Journey. In Arabic, it's called Arihla. They took uh, the story of the feel mm. of Abraha trying to destroy the Kaaba pre-Islam. So they could depict all the characters because there are no prophets. And they depict that, and it's a very, very high-quality production, extremely high-quality, and it just tells the story yeah. of when Abraha came. And the main character, who's obviously fictional, any time they're in an extremely difficult circumstance, the character reminds the people of the stories of the previous prophets. Mm. And so he'll say, despite the difficulties we're going through, remember when Musa alayhi salam was at the Red Sea, and then there's like a flashback. Oh, nice. And then it shows the Bani Israel, the children of Israel going through the desert and then Pharaoh coming. It doesn't show Musa, mm-hmm. but it shows that. And the child's like, whoa. Because I watched it with my brothers as an experiment. And they were saying, oh, wow. Do um, you mind telling us again the story of Musa and how it worked? Where, where is this available? You can just search it online. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's, it's, it's available. It like, just has a website. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then they go into the story of Hud, alayhi salam. And then they go to the story of Salih. They go into, I think, three prophet stories. And Nuh, Nuh alayhi salam too. And my brothers are, are asking me, now they're asking me all these questions. What exactly happened during the time of Nuh alayhi salam? What exactly happened during the time yeah. of Musa alayhi salam? And then they see the, uh, the, uh, the, good, pe- the good guys win. <laughs> and in right. the Quran, almost every single story, it's always the good guys that win. Always, and I think I think there there is a reason for that in our in, in our storytelling today. It's almost always the good guys win. And one of the most fascinating books I've ever read in my life is a book called it's by Joseph Campbell, and it's called A Hero with a Thousand Faces. Of course, yeah. <laughs> you're talking to two huge Star Wars <laughs> geeks, so yeah. so so we are very familiar with Joseph Campbell. And yeah. the archetypes that's right that he presents are so fascinating because. Not only are those archetypes in that story, but they also manifest in our own life. And they're in they're in the stories day. that we read for inspiration. You know, it, it's so funny. Um, you're, you're probably the second, if my memory serves, you're the second person on the podcast to bring up Joseph Campbell um, and, and, you know, um, uh, and the hero with... Uh, a hero with a thousand the, faces. A hero with a thousand faces, that's right. Um, and and this, the first one being Miraj uh, Mohyuddin who wrote the book Revelation, 
don't know if you're familiar um, with either. Do- Dr. Dr. Yeah, Mirage, Dr. Mirage. Yeah. Oh, dude, you got to you got to you got to check out Revelation. So Revelation is a book of the Sira, but written as a Western academic textbook. It's written with that reader in mind. Uh, you know, you pick up Martin Ling's and you can read it. Um, for a lot of people, they might not find Martin Ling's as, read, as readable as it may be for people of our generation, certainly. Uh, or, you know, <laughs> again, a reminder of the age. Uh, but Western academic textbooks are designed with figures and charts and 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 uh, ways of you know memorizing dates and, and FAQs, the whole, FAQs. Hmm. The whole uh, the the way the the Sierra is taught is revolutionized. It is it has a forward written by Dr. Sherman Jackson. Um, I think it has a number of articles. I mean, I know Sheikh Hamza for sure is familiar with it. Um, so uh, check it out. It's called Revelation. So it, anyway, so he was on the podcast talking about you know sort of why he you know why he he, he worked on. He's a physician by trade. But this mm-hmm. was like a passion project. Um, and, uh, you know, in fact, I, I know a lot of schools here locally were using Revelation and Dr. Asad Tarsin's Being Muslim mm-hmm. as sort of like primary texts. Like, that's all you needed. You, mm-hmm. Those two books and you were pretty much good, uh, you know, in terms of primary education. Um, so anyway, and, and he brought up this, idea, you know, about Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey. Uh it's the prophet story. It's it's certainly prophet Yusuf's story. It's Malcolm's story. It, it's it's many of the many of the stories that we get inspiration from. Uh, you know, fall in line with the archetypes that Campbell talks about. Um, so there's a there's a deep profundity there, and and he's not making that up. I mean, he's drawing yeah. on ancient traditions, yeah. uh, and, and again, storytelling tropes that are tried and true through the ages. Um, the, the, I mean, the the best story is supposed to be that of Prophet uh, Yusuf, right? That's right. And the Quran says it. Yeah. In the opening verse of that uh, of that surah. So, um, yeah, but yeah, so I completely agree with you. Um, but yeah, as we begin to wrap, I I, I do want to kind of you know come back to the conversation that I did want to have with you about this about the industry that we find ourselves in, so to speak. Um, what's out there? Maybe I'm just not in tune with the right podcast. Because in, and and maybe I should go back and, and define what I mean by there's I just find it to be a lot of noise. There there is a lot of noise. It's 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 like you know how they used, they used to say eighty five percent of startups fail. It's it's kind of like that. Like podcasts come and go. They do come and um, go, but I mean I'm talking even just, the ones that have lasted mm. are just like I'm not interested in the flavor of the week. I'm not interested in hopping on the latest social media, um, you know, outrage story. Uh, we haven't done a podcast on Andrew Tate's conversion, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe someday we will, but that doesn't, like, I, that doesn't interest me. You know, I'm not interested in the, you know, uh, there, there's like, I don't know if you're, even you are familiar, but there's like, this person is calling that person a madkhili and that person is calling this person a madkhili. Like, yeah. it's just noise, bro. Like, if you mind me saying that, um, and so he was tempted to say Berta, but he held back. <laughs> that would be going. I heard the and you were like, <laughs> it's like my kids, like, like that to me, bro, is not like I'm just not with that. So, mm-hmm. am I wrong in saying that it, there is a lot of noise out there? I will pre- I will preface this by saying, um, Alhamdulillah, I think uh, I have consumed most of the content out like I, i'm very well familiar with the muslim podcasting okay um knowing many of them personally being on many of their podcasts yeah. advising them and so forth right. Right. Uh, especially because i'm in the industry so i really need to know all the names sure. and the people and look and at what they're doing i do too i mean yeah. I'm, I'm not i don't disagree i mean i was on sultan and sneakers I and mean, in fact the the very the episode was mahin and i kind of talking about podcasting and, and and I shared a lot of these problems that I have with social media, Muslim personalities, and, or I should say, the persona that Muslims take on social media. Maybe mm-hmm. that's a rephrasing, but more appropriate. And 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 just some of the concerns that I had with a lot of the podcasts that are out there, um, or or people that are delivering content because for them I, mm-hmm. I feel it's it's about content. It's like we we just have to you know we have to put something out there. And I'm much more, you know, we've gone a month and a half, two months without a show because I'm interested in getting the right guest. Mm-hmm. You know, it's easy to put a microphone in front of me and Omar and we can talk. 
mm-hmm. but I don't think people want to listen to me and Omar talk. Mm-hmm. I want to, I mean, and people listen to the show because they want to hear Ahmed Khan. They want to hear people who have stories to share. So, I know that, which is why I, you know, we've always stayed above the fray in terms of getting into the flavor of the week or whatever mm-hmm. the latest social media outrage is. Yeah. So what I so would say, I'm with you. I, yeah. I mean, I, I know all the players. Yeah. What, and yet that's still my assessment. Yeah. It's like, it's like that meme, you know, like with the guy <laughs> sitting on the bench, like uh, I'm convinced that it's all noise. Convince me otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm that meme. Here is what I will say is the noise definitely exists. Yeah. And there are people out there who just keep continuing to create more noise, but there's also another side. Okay. I'll give you, an, I'll give you uh, uh, somebody close to me in Vancouver. Yeah. Um, he started a podcast called um, preoccupation pod. Oh, lovely. And it's a story. He's a Palestinian brother. It's a story of the history of Palestine. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean story, not history. Yeah. And the story of so it's like it's 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 very it's almost like it's fictional. Amazing. And the stories of key influential figures and how that ultimately I mean, he hasn't got into the state of Israel yet in its establishment, but he's been telling this story and he started it right before the whole Palestine thing blew up. And his numbers blew up as well, what alhamdulillah. Like the, the, the recently, well, the, the, since, uh, since Sheikh Jarrah. Oh, okay, okay. Since Sheikh okay, Jarrah, everything has kind of like okay, shifted, okay. right? Because I'm old enough to remember yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Palestine, yeah, being always so Sorry, yeah. yeah. So just about two got and a half it. years got or it, so. Got it, got it, got it. Um, so it's Lovely. one of the most popular podcasts on Palestine out there. And it's, you know, it, his whole emphasis is on, and he's a master storyteller. It's all on storytelling. Beautiful. On key figures. Yeah. What's it called? Uh, preoccupation pod. Okay. Yeah. Lovely. Right. Yeah. Referring to the preoccupation. Yeah, yeah. Even when you said the name, I kind of had a feeling what it was about. Um, preoccupation colon a not so brief history of Palestine. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, people have been raving about this new uh, show or movie on Netflix, uh, Farah. Uh, yeah. I'm hearing I've really good it. things about it. I've well, seen it. Would it was, you? It was, it was, uh, he. I, I actually messaged him and he said, because again, he he's told me direct stories of his family and right. how his family during the Nakba had to leave. And then his father was at a, you know, they were at Jordan, and his, uh, his, his, his wife didn't. She just didn't have any energy. She was tired, and he had to make it. Uh, I mean, sorry, his mother, and he had to make a decision: Do I either keep my entire family here with my mother, and you know the, the Israelis come after us, or do I abandon her and go into Jordan? Wow. Yeah. I mean, what a what a tough decision and An impossible decision. And ultimately, the decision he had to choose was he had to leave, and he never saw his, he never saw his mother again. So, what that movie, what that what the movie Farha does is it's it's really it's just a very powerful. And when I asked him, he said it was very heavy, and I don't know if I'm ready to watch it for the second time right now. Mm. Right, well, that's good. To, I mean, that's a, that's a great endorsement. I haven't seen it myself, but uh, you know, certainly want to. It's on my on my list. Um, but yeah, sorry. So but, that, but that, that's that was a phenomenal one. podcast. It's a great, 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 great podcast. Absolute phenomenal podcast. Right. Um, you know, there's other ones uh, uh, which we've mentioned and so forth. I think um, a new podcast, um, relatively new, is Blogging Theology. I, I like Blogging Theology a lot. I, I, I just I, I wish that he had more of a plurality of, of, of viewpoints. That's my only sort of uh, thing at the show. I think it's been phenomenal. Mm-hmm. I think uh, I just saw Sheikh Hamza finally appeared he's scheduled to appear next month okay 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 yeah, yeah. So. But, but 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 the point being right, what, right. I'm, what i'm highlighting yeah is for 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 muslims whatever niche you're interested in there's a podcast on it <laughs> right there's a great one on ottoman history yeah yeah phenomenal i yeah. mean they have ottoman history they have right. one on mogul history for right. those who are interested um those who are uh they have ones on i mean i think the most arguably the most popular one is a woman's one i think the digital Sisterhood. Oh, sister. yeah. I haven't checked it's, out. It's, yeah. I mean, th- there's a podcast for everything. That's why for me, I feel like if like Muslims are engaging, anybody who says Muslims are not engaging, yeah. I would say they're false. Right, right. Whether or not their engagement is correct or not is different, but they are engaging. And I, from what I'm seeing from the Muslim media discourse, I am largely pleased. Not, largely because the larger channels, I mean, the largest channels are the ones that just talk about Islam, like Merciful Servant, and so forth, and they are getting millions of views. Good, yeah, yeah. right. And this is where, like, like, like for for now in this age, we live in an age of information. Mm-hmm. Almost any topic on Islam, you can search it up online, and you can find a reputable scholar speaking on it. That's for sure, no doubts there. Yeah, 
Um, yeah. So well, I, I, I was literally just searching and adding these to my <laughs> podcast collection as you were talking. So yeah. I have, uh, I, I know uh, I'll be, I'll be uh, using my walks during the holidays. Or what wisely. you'll be listening to, yeah, during yeah. your walks. Um, well, uh, thank you, Ahmed. That was that was that was just a great conversation. I think we went we kind of covered a lot. So hopefully our listeners uh, benefited. Um, so certainly our listeners can check out your podcast, Creative Minority. They can find it on any platform where they listen to podcasts. Um, I guess if people want to engage you or reach out to you, is that the best way to do so? Um, maybe I'm sure you take listener feedback and comments. Um, or how would, how would you close the show if this was, you know, since this is going to go on your, uh, on, on your platform as well? Anything you, anything you typically share? Yeah. Just on a closing note, um, I always like to close with uh, somewhat of an Islamic reminder. Mm. Um, and always, you, you know, um, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, uh, radiallahu anhu, said that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this one surah, it would be sufficient for the Quran. And that was Surah Al Asr. And, you know, the, the early Muslims, the Salaf, they would always end their, end their meetings by reciting Surah Al Asr. And, the, it's, 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 it's arguably one of the shortest surahs in the Quran, but the meaning within the surah, you know, I can not do justice to it. I can simply do, give a translation, which I've gotten from scholars, but almost everything is in there. Um, and for those who haven't seen, I would highly recommend Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's recent lecture on the mindfulness of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The mindful Sallam, messenger. The mindful messenger where he talks about time. Mm-hmm. Because he talks about Surah Al-Asr, where Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, Wal Asr, that Allah takes an oath by time. And the scholars say whenever, you know, whenever we make an oath on something, we'll get, we make an oath on something that we value. Right? You don't make an oath on random. It's something you really value. And the scholars say when Allah swears on something, the value of that thing increases exponentially. So when Allah swears by time and then says, indeed, mankind is in a state of loss that every moment you recognize that time is the one thing that you can never get back. And that's why for me personally, doing a podcast and having guests come on makes me feel so honored because they're giving me the one thing that they can never get back, which is time. Time. That they are dedicating an hour and a half of their schedule just to sit with me, Right. right? Where they could be doing so, and these people are doing phenomenal things. Right, so Allah says that mankind is in a state of loss, except those who believe, those people in the those people who engage in righteousness, right? And some of the scholars say this is you engaging in righteousness yourself. And then they command others to righteousness. So first, uh, and what So they, they give they give a list. So step one is you seek knowledge and you you learn about what is right and what is wrong. And then you act it out on your own life, right? And then you command other people because you don't want to be a hypocrite. And once they start seeing that, you know, you're actually a man of your word, and then you're advising them, like for us, all of these great scholars, we've seen what they've done with their lives. And if they tell us to do anything, we know they've done it, right? We know like they're they're practicing it. And so, and then the last one is, and then you advise people towards patience. So um, just slowly, I'm kind of realizing, you know, the beauty of why they would always end everything by reciting Surah Al-Asr. And I think uh, it's uh, in an age where we live in an age of distraction Hmm. um, and being in the podcast industry, you know, you're taking an hour, an hour and a half of people's time. You want to make sure that it's quality, that it's something that they're benefiting from and so forth. So um, it's first most a reminder to myself, but uh, to all of us, inshallah. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you for that. Uh, I'm sure our listeners will benefit from that as well. Um, so definitely uh, check out uh, Creative Minority. Uh, and as always, uh, if you have feedback, questions for us, you can reach us uh, reach out to us on diffusecongruence at gmail.com or hit us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can find us there. Um, and I guess join us on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence and join Ahmed on his next episode of uh, Creative Minority. Inshallah. Assalamualaikum. Salaam <laughs> <laughs>